Hi, and welcome to episode 12 of Differential Diagnosis, where we're talking about episode 13 of season one of House MD called Cursed, starring that kid from Spy Kids. My name's Harvey, I'll be your co host, and co hosting with me is a very, very sick Gaz. So uh, if you were. If you didn't like his voice before, you won't like it this time. <laughs> I did petition Harvey that this is supposed to be done in text to speech and that I'd kind of slip it in. <laughs> but he disapproved. He wanted to show, he wanted me to suffer. Really. <laughs> well, Gaz has very bravely decided to push on with the podcast, even though he is very ill. But you actually sound pretty good. Oh, thanks. <laughs> relative to what is this a 10 out of 10 10? (laughs) relative to normal (laughs) you sound all right oh okay yeah it's got i i really find it because obviously like you know we're we might sound really professional but um i'm under some duvets held together by two chairs and uh gaz lies under his dusty bed so (laughs) uh, and he's surrounded by duvets as well um it's like a (laughs) it's like a sort of it's like one of those soft rooms in an insane asylum for Gaz. Oh so I, I quite like the idea that Gaz is both ill and lying under his bed. <laughs> yeah, and I, inhaling God knows what. Yeah, probably asbestos know. in that place. It's pretty we, old. Yeah. Uh, the other problem is, I guess, <laughs> we've just shattered the illusion. We've completely shattered the illusion that this podcast was, you know, produced with professional standards in mind. I'm yeah. under well, a we've bed. got the equipment. It's just we don't okay. have the <laughs> the building. Yeah. Another lie shattered, another truth unveiled for yeah. everyone to see. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I'd say we, you know, just off the back of sports medicine, we, uh, I, d- I don't know if it was the most positive. Um, it certainly wasn't the most interesting episode, and I, I don't think it was the most positive for you, but I feel like K- Cursed is definitely a... A more interesting episode, so hopefully you'll be in for a um, you'll be in for a more interesting discussion, and possibly a shorter discussion actually, because I still notice a trend that the episodes we're not really keen on we talk about for longer, which is really yeah, interesting. That is true, but it's um, quite strange, isn't it? Mm. I guess I guess that's the thing. You know, that we love dissecting what's wrong, and we we provide very short praise for what's going right in an episode. Yeah. <laughs> Which is, I guess, quite healthy for me as a neurotic person. But <laughs> for you, obviously, I am concerned. Well, I guess it's, um, I mean, but that's why, like, every, there's so many things that are about, like, complaining and criticizing. Um, Like, online, it's a very easy, like, you get, like, Angry Joe, right? The fact that yeah. he's angry is in the title because people like that stuff. Whereas, um, and yeah, I, I, I feel like we, ch- I mean, obviously we're making this because we like House and I feel like yeah. House isn't really a show that would ever warrant you being angry about it. But um, I feel that we try and avoid all the negative nitpicking, but it's, uh, as yeah. you say, it like inevitably leads to <laughs> longer, poorer episodes because, you know, you do end up nitpicking the things you don't like. Whereas you just yeah. go, yes, that was good when you like something. Yeah. Um, I, I guess that's the art of criticism as well. You know, you if you we're critically assess analyzing this show. And so sometimes where things go wrong seem more instructive. But that being said, we do then use points of comparison with previous episodes we praised to look at those that we haven't heaped as much praise on so really you're getting more bang for your buck you're getting some comparisons some comparative television criticism <laughs> that sounds pretentious as hell it well it was but uh let's go with it <laughs> yeah let's let's definitely go with yeah it. let's pretend that this is professional um so yeah you know you know the drill at this point we um we we haven't written an essay We've both watched it. We've made our notes. We've got it running in the background to spur our mind. Um, we would like you to watch it beforehand. But uh, really, we're just going to sit back and chat about House MD, the episode Cursed, for about 45 minutes to an hour. And if you want to join in, that's fine. And um, 
yeah, hopefully, hopefully you enjoy our discussion and disagree or don't disagree with us and you feel welcome to scream your points at your mobile phone. <laughs> please don't. It, please don't disagree with us. <laughs> <laughs> if you feel that way. But um, yeah. Do whatever you like. Do whatever you like. That's exactly. my that's my credo. <laughs> you want to watch it? But want to watch this? You want to listen to this podcast while you're watching the TV show? Before? After? Whatever. Do you disagree with us? Do you not? Whatever you know. And if you want to tell us, even better. Absolutely. That's my that's my ethos. Oh yeah. Yeah. There was a um an idea as well. This is a purely um separate thing. But if you are enjoying this, uh, we were thinking, and we're trying to work out a copyright friendly way to do this. <laughs> But we were somehow thinking of doing a 22-hour-long stream where we back-to-back -back watch every episode of House um, in season one after we end up finishing season one in this and possibly doing that for each season as we get through it. But um, we're working of a way to live stream it or do something without having a copyright takedown. So, um, yeah. but yeah, that, that might be something interesting that we, we have planned in about what 14 weeks or whenever yeah. it is well, we've been kind of we've been kind of throwing random ideas about what we can do to celebrate the end of seasons and you know give some additional content that people can listen or watch um yeah kind of like a commentary track but um yeah as i say like if you have any thoughts on that let us know but um yeah anyway some, some something that we've been discussing so i thought i'd chuck it into the intro of this episode all right. Uh, so, Gaz, before we get started on discussing the episode, um, why don't you give us a, a quick synopsis? Um, why don't you give us a quick synopsis on the episode itself, just so everyone can be filled in of the of the general big points? Of course. And as usual, this synopsis is powered by House.Fandom.com. Cursed is a first season episode of House, which first aired on March 1st. 2005. A Ouija board tells a young boy he will die and he soon comes down with a serious illness. As his father is a major donor to the hospital, he insists on the best they have and Cuddy presses House to take the case. As they work through the possible solutions, House wonders why the father is so familiar with certain rare diseases. Meanwhile, a visitor to the hospital allows House to put Chase under the microscope. It's a Chase episode. Foreman wasn't mentioned once in that synopsis. Oh my God. Yeah. Yeah, well, we've got some, some stressed entitled parents. We've got a great subplot with Chase for once and not Foreman. And, um, and a fascinating uh, medical mystery. So... Without any further delay, let's get on with our differential diagnosis, Season 1, Episode 13, Cursed. What a snappy first line. Yeah. It's all about I, the tongue, man. Stick I, it in their mouth. Yeah. <laughs> I do. Uh, yeah, I love hearing about like 12 year olds making out as an opener. <laughs> yeah. This kid really oversells it, though. So the uh, not not making out with kids. I, I wouldn't know about that. <laughs> Because I the didn't hell make are you out talking with about? Well, I'm saying I didn't make out with people as a kid, and I haven't made out with them since because that's extremely illegal. So I'm, just, <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> so no, what I'm actually saying is I'm giving some context. All right. So it's um, so yeah, the show starts with I think a pretty interesting opening in which it's two kids going into a house to um, to presumably make out with girls and and have a drink and take part in some cool secret club, but um, I do have to say the. The, the kid that's telling the spy kid's kid, who will eventually be the patient, who's the more sort of on edge one. He doesn't really want to be there. He's sort of very scared. Um, he really oversells it because he talks about all these girls and then they get in there and it's just these two fucking <laughs> little boys 
drinking and smoking cigarettes. I guess it's the perception, you know, everything feels real, more heightened and real to them. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah. I think it's... um Everyone's I... making, a, making out their adults and they can do adult things, such as play Ouija boards. Yeah, exactly. There's, it's quite funny that they think like... it's. I mean, it's really... It's very funny in the way it's set up that these kids are like really cool that they're doing a Ouija board and having a beer. But it's um the the way I mean the way the teenagers talk is is terrible. Um, I don't remember. I I mean I wasn't an American teenager, so I don't know if they talk like that. But the way that teenagers are written is always really funny in shows like this. It gets yeah. the point across that it's kind of like an intense situation for the patient. But it's so funny the way they're like, "Hey, man, don't be such a downer." <laughs> I just want to drink my light beer and <laughs> smoke my mama's cigarettes. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's much like the kind of clunky writing with authority figures, which might belie yeah. a kind of author, a kind of libertarian streak in the writers, in my opinion. But... <laughs> so David Shaw hates authority figures and children. Well, you have established this before, actually. Yeah, but it's um, um... children are complete dweebs in this. They are. Oh, the patient especially is perfectly written to be a dweeb, but um. It's a very, yeah, but as, as as an intro, it's sort of, it's, it's, it's an interesting setup because it's, um, it's sort of, it doesn't, it, it, no one's really ill at the start. It's like more of an actual event in which he falls over and then you can kind of put it together that, oh, maybe he became ill from that, from falling over and cutting himself in the attic, mm. but it's not like anyone clenching their chest and there's no like ill red herrings or anything. Yeah. It's not obvious. And then it it skips in time to... His mom asking him if he's okay when he's at home a few weeks later. Yeah, really she, he's just had he's just had a fever for an entire week. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> could you imagine? I'd be going to the hospital after like two days. Well, maybe she's got the same sort of outlook as that husband from Fidelity. He's like, "Oh, honey, you've been unconscious for three days. No Where's problem. my electrolytes?" <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Still one of my favorite lines. Well, yeah, that's the thing. She she only she only realizes it all because she's like get ready for school like she's been totally ignoring him the for an entire time. week just get to... <laughs> <laughs> but it's oh. um i mean what what, what do you think because the cold opens are sort of like they're so brief but they are they are interesting because they do they mm. do kind of set up about how engaged you're going to be and um I, I think that's a particularly like solid opening i think it's more interesting i can't really mm. say why it just feels very different to the others it's like not so obvious when someone's going to be ill and because it's teenagers hanging out in an attic it kind of feels like it's from a different show yeah which i quite like about cold opens when they kind of feel different to the program that they're in because it's kind of like they go from their own world to house's world yeah i don't know why i like that but i feel like that opening does that y yes and this is something that happens very quickly so we go from that kind of weird oh he he thinks he's dying which he might well be but the other part of it is as soon as that cold open is over, we're propelled straight into House's world and he's already trying to figure out, is it pneumonia or is it this or is it that? Also, why are you bugging me? <laughs> like, yeah. well, they then, do, they then do the nice thing where Cuddy's walking around trying to <clears throat> like telling him about the, the, you know, the problems this kid's had. And House immediately deduces that because she's bothering him, then it must be a donor, which yeah. sets up a lot about the father of the child, of the child yeah. patient. On top of that, he's also desperately looking for Vicodin, which tells us that maybe his Vicodin habit has gotten a bit worse since last time. And then they also set up the interesting element, which is that he becomes interested, you know, in the case because of what Cuddy says. So even though he's acting disinterested, he's actually has to take the case in the end because he can't help himself. Yeah. But yeah, again, that scene does a lot of things as well. It's also introducing the idea of money into this now. Like, could he's become more, it's being introduced even more as a kind of managerial figure. Yeah. She, she's thinking about the balance sheet. Very interesting. And this is foreshadowing what's going to come up in the next episode. Yeah, with, uh, so with, watch out. with Vogler. But, um, <laughs> but, you're, but you're right. They're kind of, yeah, they're setting it up here that she cares about money coming into the hospital because that's how she funds everything that's part of her job other than being a doctor so yeah yeah you're right it's not like vogler comes in in the next episode and they're like 
hey. and suddenly she's terribly concerned about money. It kind of sets it up here. That's very interesting. Yeah. It also gets uh, mentioned later on with the father of Gabe um, talks about his ish- why he's a big donor for the hospital because it means he can get basically preferential treatment. Yeah. Well, I think... Um... Yeah, should we should we should we talk about the the patients for now? I think that the the patient drama. I mean, there's a lot of drama here because they kind of have like the melting pot of all the characters you can have. You have a child as the patient. You've got two divorced parents, one of which is the donor father who's like really intense and really angry, and he wants what he wants. And then you've got the mother who's kind of quite sweet, and then you've got the kid who kind of takes after the mother. So. There's a lot of sort of disagreements and hostility, mostly fueled by the father, but it's yeah. um it's definitely a melting pot for human drama and screaming. Yeah, the other thing about this is it this um kind of patient drama also segues into and becomes a callback for uh Chase and uh a visitor to the hospital that happens to be his father, um, who's just visiting and he's a renowned physician himself. Um, so it start it, this kind of interaction between Chase and the patient becomes like the establishes a few themes, mm. like son to son kind of empathy. Yeah, it's got um, it's very similar to the Socratic method because we see he kind of bonded with the kid there over his relationship with his mother. Mm. Yeah. And then we learn about Chase's mother and they're doing the same thing here. It's the son's relationship with his father and how they're so different is how Chase is emoting with him. And then, as you say, Chase's father actually turns up for seemingly professional reasons. But we'll go on to discuss the um, the Chase father subplot. But uh, hey, yeah. good to see good to see an episode about Chase and not Foreman for once. Yay. Yeah, it's not the Foreman uh, George Costanza craziness again yeah. hey what sort of crazy things is foreman gonna do this time around <laughs> whoa my neuroses about my father complex with house is getting in the way of my practice mm. sorry i just had to <laughs> say that i think also the yeah the the i i quite like about like the child patient is that so Chase asks him some questions while the patients are in, while the parents are in the room. He won't tell him. But then Chase takes him away from the parents and then kind of has a very candid discussion with him and tells him that he won't be in trouble. And I quite like that what they do with that is that, you know, children are very good at talking to like authority figures. They want to sort of tell the truth more often than not. Yeah. And I quite like that this episode isn't like sports medicine. It's like caked in lies. Like they could have done it that the kid wouldn't say anything until the very end and finally he breaks instead chase takes him away lies to the parents of why he needs to get him alone and then like the patient immediately tells him the answer and it's Mm. um it's nice that they're avoiding the whole lie fest (laughs) that was in sports medicine last time because that did get a bit crazy yeah that was very much kind of deception mania Mm. (laughs) everyone was deceiving someone um (laughs) We also, in this episode, we see more of the kind of relentlessness of House's need to know things because it extends over from the pace, the case to people. He yeah. wants to know Chase and his relationship with his father. Yeah, he's extremely antagonistic in this because <laughs> yeah. Chase's father was kind of going to pop in and then pop out, but um, House keeps him around actively to bother Chase. And obviously Chase's father sticks around because he wants to see Chase. But it's, mm. um, yeah, House is like, knows the situation is very fragile, but as you say, like is so interested that he kind of blows all that off and just... Well, he, he uses the analogy of chemical reaction. He says, well, <laughs> yeah. you don't know how they're going to react. And sometimes they don't tell you how they're going to react if you ask them up front. So you have to put them together and add a little heat. I thought that was a really good little analogy for how he works. Yeah, it also shows he's very detached. <laughs> like he removes all of the context of it. And it's like, you know, it's just like, yeah, just like putting two wasps, a wasp and a hornet in a jar. He's like, oh, I just want to see how they interact. And he also referred to it as if it was a 
kind of diagnostic medicine ca- medical ca- a medical case mm. so he was like differential diagnosis for a man going silent when his father comes in the room <laughs> exactly <laughs> it's so, it's borderline menacing and a little bit weird <laughs> yeah but but it's uh, it's a it's a thing that we haven't really seen but it, yeah you're right it's an interesting way to establish that house is a obsessive about knowing things and even though that's like that's like quite even though like that knowing things can be about like patient mysteries or just like personal mysteries which is basically just gossip but he's just fascinated even though you think like that kind of thing like because he kind of shirks off like personal relationships and things yeah I think there's there's even a great line where Chase says, how would you feel if I was interfering in your life? And Chase, like personal life and House says, well, that's why I don't have a personal life. But um, but yeah, even <laughs> yeah. though even though he doesn't, see, you know, you think that he doesn't care about this stuff, it's quite interesting. They kind of reframe it and say, actually, he's fascinated with other people's personal lives, though, because it's a mystery. And that's yeah. when it matters. If he like he knows why Cameron is like. He knows why Cameron is like a tryhard. He knows why Foreman is the way he is. And he doesn't find it quite as interesting. So he kind of ignores all that stuff, all like their sad stories. But as soon as he doesn't know the, about Chase's sad story and like the context of it, he's fascinated. It's just look, And he looks for ways to antagonize both parties by getting his fa- getting Chase's father involved in the case as well. He's just, oh, it's just... It, what people always try and say is that House is sometimes a little bit different from Sherlock Holmes in a lot of ways. And in a way, yes, that is true. But in other ways like this, he's kind of the same. He wants mm. to know how people tick. He wants to know how to solve the case. And he kind of strips things of their kind of humanizing qualities <laughs> and then subjects them to a number of ethically questionable tests. Which I find quite disturbing. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, and he's um, and that we could talk about the um, because I'd say I'd say in general the, the 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 patient drama itself is they very quickly they very quickly learn. Well, there's there's more to it, but they very quickly establish what it is, and then there's another complication, and the rest of the episode is trying to is kind of caused by that red herring like this kid has anthrax which he caught in the attic but because it's reacting differently for mysterious reasons which will which is part of the patient drama they um they get really confused about what it is and that also causes some tension between chase and his dad so should we should we discuss the chase and his dad story and why it's like well actually the diagnose the patient story and chase's dad story are actually thematically connected in a particular way mm, um, and I think it's a good way for us to get into um, of drilling into the chase issue because it's a, I was trying to isolate them you're trying to connect them go ahead I'm trying to connect them um, because I think they, they are connected because in the case of um, the patient Gabe and his father mm. uh, he, the father knows something and uh, it's kind of just slowly trying to get the doctors to check that. It's like, what about this? <laughs> Is this a problem? Is it a problem? Please tell me it's a problem or not. Like, I'm not going to tell you the truth that I might have it. But, you know, what if? Um <laughs> And then on the other hand, you have this kind of, you have Chase's father who uh, is coming over to try and connect with his son after a long period of time away from him, from a very contentious relationship where uh, Chase's father walked out on him and had divorced uh, Chase's mother and then Chase's mother had died because of alcohol alcoholism essentially and robert chase was left to look after his mother until she did die so there's a lot of resentment of how um 
how they how he had been treated by Chase's father mm. um and that he kind of was disappointed in his father for not um for not being there for him but had then grown accustomed to the idea and just said well if you don't expect him to be there then you can't be you can't be disappointed if you don't expect him to be present in your life if you don't expect him to do the basic things a father's supposed to do you can't be disappointed you should forego any sort of expectation yeah um and how that connects up to the other story is that at the end of to the clinical patient <laughs> is the fact that at the end of the at the tail end of the story um gabe is found to have filiar what is it the two conditions that had come up filiaritis or whatever yeah he's got leprosy that, that his father and then therefore got leprosy he contracted leprosy, which then aggravated the anthrax infection, and then it ended up in a kind of vicious circle where these things just kind of spiralled and spiralled and spiralled and made him worse um, until he was getting like quite pronounced neuropathy in his arm. Um, but the, re the reason this wasn't known initially was the fact that um, father had not disclosed that he instead of being an airline air force pilot or whatever he was actually just on a hippie commune for ages and had contracted a very kind of slow acting but very contagious form of leprosy that hmm. over a period of time and exposure with his son had he had contracted or was it in utero i can't remember um it it doesn't it doesn't really say yeah. Because the wife hasn't contracted it, so it's possible that he had it since. But the main thing is that that Gabe expresses disappointment and doesn't think he can really uh, treat his father the same since this revelation that actually he wasn't an airline force pilot and he had made his entire life was a lie, and all the expectations and things that he had done were lies. Yeah. Um, and it's through that. Um through Chase consoling him and saying, look, you've just got to love your father. You can't do anything different. Yeah, you can be disappointed now, but in the end, you will always still love him. And that creates a revelation between Chase's father and himself, where he says, well, yeah, I've got to still love him, even if I am disappointed by what he's done in the past. At least he's here now. Yeah, that's true. So that's how they're connected together. Mm. Oh, no. I just, I just yeah. elaborated the entire plot by no, accident. No. Well, I agree. No, you've 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 shown where that connection is, and yeah, we probably shouldn't talk about them in isolation to such a degree. I agree. It's no, um, that's, but that's now split them apart. Well, I I, I did always find it funny at the end when like because Chase obviously yeah through telling that kid how he should feel about his dad, he kind of rationalizes his own thoughts. But it's quite yeah. funny because that kid definitely. Definitely hasn't had it as bad as Chase. So I wonder if the back of the head, if he's thinking like, yeah, what you think your dad lying about being an airplane pilot is bad. <laughs> Wait till you get left at 15 with your like dying alcoholic mother. Yeah. If he wanted to be more competitive about the scenarios. I, I don't think, I don't think Robert Chase wants to be competitive about the scenario. No, I, I agree. Do you, do you find, I find... Chase's dad is really interesting and will, he's very like, I, I, what I quite like is that he's, and I found this very interesting while watching it again, is that he, Chase's dad doesn't really do anything. As you say, it's that moment where, it's that moment where Chase is telling the kid how he should feel about his dad's situation, that he kind of rationalizes that, you know, he's my dad and I should like, you know, I should really, I should make a go of it. But it's quite funny because Chase's dad never does that. Mm. And it's a very, but it's very consistent with his personality because we know that he was the kind of guy who worked long hours. He didn't really pay attention to his son. He's kind of just got this idea that he's my son and I'll be there for him. And my son should like, you know, we should get on. But it's like, he doesn't really know how to, how to do that mm. because he's quite a disconnected, like, you know, always professional man. And it's um, it's it's quite interesting how that kind of is straight through to the end. Like Chase's father, 
you know, he, he never, he never really even apologizes. He just says, oh, you, you're angry about the divorce. Like he kind of, he kind of understands why Chase is angry, but he never apologizes for it. He just says like, me and your mother's marriage was too bad and I just had to leave. And then even at the end when Chase has that revelation and goes to try and find his dad, you know, his dad, um, his dad just says like, oh, I've got my flight soon, so we can't have a drink. And they have a nice hug and they have a moment and the dad kind of appreciates that. But it's not like the dad says, but you know what? I will miss that flight. We'll go have a drink and I'll get a later flight. And it's, it's in a way, it's kind of nice. And I, I think the house, house, the house writers do that a lot. They have like these quite realistic moments where yeah. people are flawed and they do make mistakes. Like Chase's father should have stayed because we do learn that Chase's father is really there because he's got stage four lung cancer, which house deduces. But uh, and kind of he's there because he wants to tell Chase, but he doesn't because he's incapable. And it's kind of like this consistent thing that sure, Chase's father comes to the hospital you know, Chase interacts with him and in the end, Chase kind of forgives him and they hug. The father never does anything to make up for that. He kind of turns up, he has cancer, he doesn't tell Chase and then he just leaves mm. knowing that he'll be dead by the time Chase is able to visit him again. And it's really bleak. Yeah, but it's, it's very, really very bleak. Consistent it's... with the character. It's, um, it... yeah, it's, it's... I mean, if Chase's dad was a nice guy who was chasing forgiveness... He would uh, a lot of the word chase there, but if he was chasing <laughs> Chase's forgiveness, he would have, um, you know, he would have turned up ages ago and be like, "Son, I'm so sorry. Let's, you know, let's go out. What can I do for you?" But he kind of he's he's always got this kind of indifferent element to him, and I quite I quite like that about it. I thought it was very realistic. Yeah, yeah it's I, how I, people I... actually go through crises in their families. Like no one has a big moment. Like yeah. people just kind of ignore stuff, and then it's too late. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And some people just resign themselves to things, right? Uh, I mean, yeah. what it does is it exposes the flaws of the characters and doesn't allow for that easy resolution. Yeah, Maybe exactly. the, sometimes the resolution is just Chase's dad will pass away. Yeah. And then and, Chase will be sad. Yeah. And that's it. <laughs> the interesting thing is that House kind of sticks by this kind of ethic of not telling Chase or Robert Chase, that his father is dying. Well, I'm, I see, I, I disagree with you. I don't think House sticks to anything. So no, the context okay. for that is that House deduces it and Chase's dad tells him not to tell Chase. And then House brings him in to the room to tell him. And then Chase sort of goes on a monologue that you said later earlier about the whole, if you don't have any expectations, then... You know, my father could never fail. Yeah, and I, I think, I think in a way, actually, I don't think House sticks to an ethic. I think House was going to tell him. I just think that House kind of hears Chase's basically disown his father and just makes a decision that you know what, I'm not going to tell you because you've already made your decision that you, you know, you've made your decision that you don't care about your father, and actually, I don't think this will change anything. So mm. I'm not sure he sticks to an ethic. I think he just decides that actually when Chase convinces him that he hates his father, he goes, okay, he probably doesn't deserve to tell you. So well, he, he doesn't say he doesn't hate his father. He just doesn't expect anything from him. That's yeah. the difference. I, I mean, I, I would say there's a bit of hatred there. <laughs> I think skepticism. Okay. Uh, skepticism tainted with a kind of indifference. Like he's skeptical. Why? But then you have moments where... When Chase's dad says, I miss you. He says, I miss you. Chase doesn't say it back, though. No. Yeah. <laughs> I, it... But yeah, little things like, because as you say, like, Chase's father doesn't say anything. He just says, I miss you, which isn't an apology. No. It's more of a, I'm not getting something out of this. <laughs> and yet it's, but that's well, the way did... he expresses himself. He does but... apologize for the way he, he had left Chase in that situation and that his mother had died though. I mean, it's not complete yeah. ignorance or uh, uh, Oh, no, not at avoidance. all. But, but the way the, the way he says it is it's not I'm terribly sorry. Oh my god, how can I forgive myself? He's like I'm sorry. I you know, I'm sorry you had to go through that. I think it's more like that. He as you say he identify he can identify the problem, but he he's mm. just so rigid. He 
just won't he won't just make and, that next step and just say it's my fault because I don't think Chase's dad thinks it's his fault. I think he's just one of those people who just thinks that he made all the right calls. Hmm. It's um, it's just fascinating to see because I mean, any most of the dramas there would be a resolution and there isn't really. Hmm. It's kind of a bittersweet resolution. Yeah, it's a nice. It's more of a moment than a resolution. I think that's what House does very well. It doesn't have nice resolutions. It just has nice moments within terrible situations. <laughs> yeah. And that's because in a, in a way that's quite realistic i think um like you know i've i've certainly got problems with many people and i think oh, many of those problems okay. will go unresolved right. till we die but <laughs> we have some nice moments within that where we kind of go okay fair enough <laughs> oh my jeez all right well you've exposed that part of your character now we've well, got yeah, to do absolutely. a video live stream but 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 we all have that and yeah. it's uh, i think house just i think this is a particularly well-realized way to express that um yeah it's that sometimes the human elements of relationships aren't always the nice smushy lovely moments we see portrayed on stereotypical television yes that actually sometimes they're a bit more hard-nosed and a lot more about what's not said than what is said mm. that's important <laughs> you see the frankness that Chase's dad talks to House about his diagnosis and about his plans and how he feels. Then he doesn't do that with his own son. You know, it's the things not said that's really interesting in this, um, in this episode, mm. or at least not said between each other. Yeah, and the fact he can say it to House and not to his son kind of gives you the implication that there's a lot of shame there that he's not willing to admit because if he says it to Chase and Chase doesn't feel bad for him, then he'll feel like some shame that, you know, maybe he deserves it. But if he tells it to House, he's just... Mm. Also, he doesn't want to have his... have, you know, Chase act in a kind of way that's only because he has cancer, not because he's a human being that may be... You know, it's not, he'll be treating like a patient, not like an, a human being. Yeah. You know, because he's a doctor. That's his kind of mode of operation. I'm not saying he's in a bit in, unable to process human emotion <laughs> or to yeah. see people in that light, but it would it would cloud or in some way obscure his ability to engage with his father in the way that his father wants but doesn't really ask for. So that's the problem. I think that's one of the interest. not a problem, but the really interesting parts of it, it's that, you know, he's Chase's dad can't ask for those things hmm. because then they can never be delivered to him. You know, he can't ask for for Chase to love him. He can't ask for Chase to forgive him because the moment he does that, it it, it becomes more complex, more difficult, more. Yeah. And he almost to... admits that there's something to forgive, which I don't think he thinks. Yeah. Because I, 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 I think from that last conversation, he says, I'm sorry in a very like, you know, it's like if you fell in mud while we were walking down the street and I'm like, oh, God, I'm sorry that happened to you. I'm not really apologizing. I'm giving my condolences. <laughs> yeah. I think that's the way that Chase's father really feels about it. Well, it's like all things. These things are more complex than they seem. Yeah as well and it's the way that the writers make that entire through the dialogue dialogue and lack of dialogue they give us a tantalizing sense of the world beyond the hospital the world in that chase's life is more complicated and chase's father's life is more complicated and more expansive than we know and mm. but we want to know so it keeps us going keeps us involved keeps us intrigued great character writing it is it i mean that's the thing i like about this series but in particular this episode it just knows when to shut up hmm. <laughs> no and way. then off just... the unsexy cancer element and onto the more sexy stuff we get a little glimpse into wilson might be having an affair again oh for crying out loud and Come yet on, this wilson. this is paid off in the season as far as i remember but it's um, it might be the next season, actually, but th th we keep seeing Wilson talking with 
um attractive women work in the hospital like house comes in he sort of says oh there's more going on there and wilson's always like no no we're just talking about business <laughs> we're just talking about business but um but yeah it's kind of these little things are still being set up and i i think that's very funny that uh, it's such a minor point it's like two seconds and it's a throwaway comment from house but these things do get paid off yeah and it's uh it's great that there's kind of just happening now I'm surprised there isn't a Tumblr of Wilson talking to attra attractive women. Yeah, well, I mean, there's enough moments. <laughs> yeah, you could definitely stockpile a number of images. <laughs> oh, this is a bit weird. <laughs> I, I, I could be a brilliant stepmom. I'm very lenient. Ooh. <laughs> yeah, this is the. Uh, this is uh, Cameron the... being actually quite cold about Chase's. <laughs> situation in a way she's saying like, oh how bad could it be and it, it is actually quite bad <laughs> yeah this is this is insane and it just starts making all these presumptions and then she's a bit surprised when she gets kind of stonewalled <laughs> so oh so your father beat you then <laughs> yeah i think um i think in a way it's it's it might be i, I think that scene is really i don't think I think any character could have had that conversation with Chase. I'm not sure it says a lot about Cameron, but I think mm. the point of that conversation where Cameron's questioning, like, why can't he just forgive this father? Is you remember in the uh, earlier in the uh, season where I think it was in the Socratic method where they were talking about alcoholism and Foreman didn't believe that Chase could know any alcoholics because he was rich and lived a good mm. life. And Chase said, you know, there are still alcoholics. They just drink nicer stuff. I think this is trying to bring that back. I think Cameron is questioning Chase on his relationship with his father because in a way she is making that same mistake. She doesn't believe that it could be that bad he, she's because, taking... because of their lifestyle. So I think that she's I think that she's doing that. And then when Chase shuts her down, I think it takes her a bit by surprise. And I think it's in the same way that he did it with Foreman, where Foreman, when Chase said, oh, they drink nicer booze, the rich people. And I do know alcoholics kind of shut foreman down a bit and he went oh maybe there's more to chase than i thought there was yeah and that's i think that kind of does that with camera and it kind of continues this idea that as you said we've said before that chase is kind of supposed to be the generic you know medical procedural perfect doctor very handsome very witty yeah. very charismatic and this is kind of twisting that and saying that perception is very wrong yeah it, and it's supposed to i think his unique selling point at the moment is that his whole character is deeper than you think, not what it seems. Yeah. Don't take him at face value, which I'm saying in a very snarky way, but actually is true at the moment. Like people try and challenge him on his hardships as if they're frivolities to him because he seems to come from a well-to-do family. But actually everyone has their own struggles. Yeah, exactly. And, and I think like Chase's struggles are, you know, they're, they're, they're not only, they're, they're real, they're very well realized, but I think they're also, um, like, it's, it's also interesting, like that Chase isn't being brought down by them. Like Chase has rationalized them. He's like, with that, like, don't have any expectation speech. He, he's worked his way out of them. So it's like, yeah, it's it's not just a, a a bland mystery with oh Robert Chase seems perfect, but he's got a bit more going on. It like feels like he's actually a proper character who's gone through those things and has had thoughts about them and gone over them. And um, because as I say, his father turns up and he doesn't start arguing with him or tell him to, you well, know, or go ape shit. He kind of like talks to him like a colleague, but he's a bit annoyed by him. Yeah, because there's that kind of professional barrier as well. Yeah, exactly, and then. And then that that hug at the end is about as good of a payoff as we can ever have. Um, yeah. And will ever have, because obviously this is, interestingly, the only episode that Chase's father shows up. Yeah. Uh, unless he's in a flashback. But um, yeah, later on it deals with, we, we do then learn about uh, Chase's father's death later in what is a fantastic episode, which we'll get to at some point. But um, this is the only episode where he turns up. Yeah. I, I think the other thing is, it's as if, 
when he has that kind of showdown with House, that's his rationalisation up to that point. But as we see, the patient drama makes him think twice about it. Yeah. So, you know, it's not as straightforward as that. It's whatever rationalisation he has at that point. Yeah, yeah, good point. <laughs> well, because yeah. deep down he does want to connect with his father, and that's as you said, that's kind of the theme that you've noticed between the two is that, you know, it. But it, it's not done in a way that, like, you know, Eastenders would do it. It's like your family, your family's <laughs> important. You can't not love your family. Like, but there, <laughs> but there is there is an element of that as like you know sort of the idea of not loving your parents is very difficult. And it's it's almost a tragedy to lose that. So um which which is very true. Like, you know, it, it it you know, your parents can treat you much worse than many other people can because it's there's something really sad about losing a connection with those kind of people. Right. Um, which I think the show uh does very well in this episode, but it's um yeah, it's sort of all of those like fluffy, like, ooh, your family's important. They're the closest people you'll ever have, but it kind of handles it in a mature way. I'm not. I'm not really sure how best to vocalize that better. Other than at no point was I like going, "Oh, this is very sentimental and annoying." Yeah, it kind that's of the main. Thing. Had the sentimental stuff, but it didn't have any sentimental stuff. Mm. I don't know, guys. What do you think about? It? I feel like we've talked about the whole thing. Yeah, the patient. In essence, the patient got has leprosy because his dad is a bit of a hack fraud. <laughs> um, and that also means that he then got anthrax because of the crappy insulation in the house that he was visiting when he was doing the seance with his clubhouse gang. Yeah. Um, and basically it was a vicious circle. One was antagonizing the other into attacking the body mm. and then and in turn that, each other. that conflict with the father and his lie then is resolved <clears throat> through chase's speech but it also feeds into chase's story very very good thematic tie of patient and doctor drama like all the it's 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 the is that good old thematic medical and human drama that when they come together, House does it really well. And I, I didn't really remember Cursed particularly well. Um, but it's uh it, it it is it is definitely one of those episodes. It's it definitely doesn't stand out like the Socratic method. No. Or 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 DNR or something where everything's so thematically tied, but it but it's one of those episodes. It, yeah. It should I'm... definitely be like on the you know, on the nice, you know, th- theme not you know, if you could put episodes into a box and tie them together and go, ooh, really got the themes together. Um, Cursed is one of those episodes, which is interesting because it mm. certainly doesn't stand out, but it's extremely well written. What would I say? Um, well, yeah, it is extremely well written in that respect. The themes do tie up very, very well. Um, the other thing is, you also get that the main kind of high point of this episode is when Chase is sitting down with with House and discussing all of this and House is just sitting there as if he's receiving a revelation about a new disease that he needs to treat (laughs) or like a conundrum that he's just solved. Yeah. It's as if the, you know, Chase is giving him, Chase is like a disease (laughs) communicating its symptoms to him. And then he goes, "Ah, oh, okay, gotcha." Okay, exactly. and as soon and as soon as he learns it, he loses interest. I don't think yeah. he even interacts with the father from that point on. He doesn't care. <laughs> it's madness. That that is quite disturbing. He, he's, he kind he's of a creates total... this. <laughs> Sorry, go on. <laughs> he creates a scenario that antagonizes both, makes them extremely upset. <laughs> Only just so that Chase can tell him what the the beef is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's he's, 
I mean, it, it's really interesting that we're learning these things about it. And these are and these are things that you kind of take for granted now. But looking back at it, it's so funny. Like the way it's set up is really quick and well done, and it's just totally crazy. And it's <laughs> and it's done. It's not done with like some sort of flippant situation. Like it's not like House is interesting, like the lives of a of someone in the uh, in the clinic. It's like done with Chase and his father, whose father will be dead in three months. And like, this is the last time they spend together and House gets in the middle is like, I need to know. It's like a really, it's a really intense situation that House gets involved in. And once he knows, he doesn't care. And it's a really funny way to bring that in to his like character repertoire. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We're starting to see the blending of that kind of diagnostic skill in medicine slowly merging with the people around him. His tentacles are kind of trying to yeah. seep in and suss out everybody. Yeah, you kind of see that his his skills and his sort of poor qualities aren't isolated to medicine. Yeah. They're, they're part of him. Because, I, I, I mean, I know I've said this before, but when Hugh Laurie said, you know, House has such good, like, deduction skills and is so intelligent that even if, you know, if he was a weapons dealer, he'd be the best weapons dealer in the world. It just happens to be that he's a doctor. I think this is one of those episodes that's really tying it up, like, this kind of, like, deduction and, like, kind of um, obsessiveness isn't just isolated to medicine. It's just every detail about life. It just so happens that most of his focus goes into medical problems. Yeah. I think, funnily enough, Hugh Laurie plays a weapons dealer. He does in uh, the, the Night Manager. Yeah. <laughs> so, I don't know if he was just gunning for that gig or yeah maybe maybe he was just gig. like trying to slot it in 10 years early be like can't wait till they adapt this <laughs> so i think in essence it was a good episode yeah i think i think that's the that's the summary really if <laughs> if if there was ever one to give i think it's it's a very well thematically tied together episode that stands up where there with the greats it, it it's not quite as memorable as the other episodes, and I'm not entirely sure why. But it, it, it maybe it, it lacks a certain something. Maybe the patient element is maybe too standard, or the chase and his father drama doesn't quite stand out. But, but because everything's so thematically tied together and is quite low key and realistic, I, I think it's a really great episode that really stands with the best of them. Yeah, I but think it's, it's not remembered. I think the strength of it you see in the ending. I yes, think that's, that, what, that's what makes it great. Yeah, and that I mean, that's only like half of it. Like that's half the payoff where they yeah. have this bittersweet moment because when we then learn that he's, the father does die and we never see him again, That that's what really completes it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's one hell of an episode because you can watch it, enjoy it, but actually knowing what happens makes the episode even better. Yeah. It's like the episode's real payoff is like in two years from this point. <laughs> um. <laughs> Which is which is great. It's great setup and great payoff. And mm. um, yeah, what a what a what a cracking episode! And once again, a good episode wow. that we both enjoyed. Smash through that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we're very efficient when we like something. I think that's the thing. That's the problem. And maybe that maybe we should become more hateful. We, we, really we crack share up the a common. We share a common thing when it comes to food, where if we really <laughs> like something, we'll eat it very very quickly. <laughs> And I think in this case, that's exactly the same sentiment applies here to TV. If, yeah. if, if we like something, we seem to digest it, digest or analyze it very, very quickly. Yeah. With no sort of uh, <laughs> airs or graces or savoring any moments. It's just boom. We well, that's the thing as well. If like if If the writers have gotten across the theme and the point and the... And everything so well that there's, as I think you've said this before, there's not much to talk about because it's like by watching the episode, you're on the same page of the discussion. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, well, I think that's about all for this week. Thank you very much for watching this episode of Differential Diagnosis, where I think we've differentially diagnosed season one, episode 13, Cursed, pretty well. Hopefully, uh, hopefully Gaz will be better by next week. He won't be because we're about to record the next episode now, so he'll sound just <laughs> as ill, but you'll think that he's been ill for a week. And then maybe I'll think about taking him to the hospital. <laughs> oh, you, you, you're, a good, you're a good friend. Oh, cool back. So, um, <laughs> so uh, 
well, thank you very much for watching. And and as always, we've uh, we've got our, our Facebook and Twitter, which we really like to hear from you. Uh, if you can give us a review anywhere, that'd be great. And um, yeah, until then, we'll we'll keep getting them out every Monday morning or later if I something comes up. <laughs> <laughs> And um, but yeah, once again, we 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 really appreciate you uh, for listening to this, and we can't wait to keep pushing on to the end of season one, where maybe we'll have a season one bonanza, which Ooh. you can join us at. So um, yeah, it's goodbye from me, and and it's goodbye from him. <laughs> all right, see you all next week.